Thank you, Alan. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here, uh, having, as Alan said, been with the uh, associated with the Institute since its inception. It's really been a privilege to watch it grow into an internationally recognized organization. And uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Paul for his foresight and generosity in creating not only an enabling platform technology and uh, uh, enabling data set that has been of great use to the community, but also in creating what's really a novel institutional model for achieving and generating those data. So <clears throat> my lab is broadly interested in the question of how uh, emotion is represented in the brain. And uh, actually, how do I operate the pointer here? I got it, the little button, yeah. And uh, in reflecting on this, I realized that the Experience Music Project and Science Fiction Museum is really an ideal place to talk about this subject because it, and, and particularly in the context of open questions in neuroscience, because I think one of the biggest open questions in neuroscience is to understand the mechanistic underpinnings of the perceptual and emotional experiences uh, that occur when we experience music. Uh, and at this point, I would say our level of understanding of this process is such that any attempt to try to explain it in mechanistic terms is really an exercise in science fiction. So experiencing music and science fiction go together quite well uh, in this context. What we are trying to do is uh, to reduce this problem uh, to, its, to a cellular and connectional level. And to do that, we need to use the, uh, the current psychologist definition or experimental psychologist definition of emotion, which is not the colloquial use of the term, meaning our subjective experience of the internal feeling state, but rather emotion in this context refers to the objectively observable external behaviors that are associated with those internal states. So if the, if the internal state is one of fear, then the external expression of that state, the emotional behavior, is freezing behavior. And as I said, we're interested in using the kinds of tools that Alan described to dissect the circuits that are involved, their modulation by chemical factors such as dopamine and serotonin, and also to use uh, model systems such as Drosophila to begin to try to understand when and how uh, the, the uh, primitives of emotion may have uh, evolved. And uh, in the interest of time, I'll just focus on one exemplar of our work in the area of fear uh, in the mouse brain. Now, <clears throat> for those of you unfamiliar with the circuitry, the overall circuitry of fear, uh, fear stimuli converge through a number of different sensory pathways through sensory cortex and thalamus to a medial temporal lobe structure called the amygdala. And the amygdala then relays information outwards to downstream effector structures that control motor responses such as freezing, autonomic responses such as increased heart rate, and a hypothalamic adrenal pituitary axis functions such as increases in stress hormones like cortisol. Now the amygdala is not a unitary structure, but it's actually a collection of about a dozen different aggregates of neurons or nuclei. And a large body of work over several decades by Joe Ledoux, Mike Davis, Michael Fancelow, and their colleagues have begun to assign different functions in the acquisition of learned fear to different nuclei within this structure. So, the, uh, in, in a Pavlovian fear conditioning paradigm where the animal learns to associate a tone with a foot shock such that when tested a day later, the tone elicits a fear response in the absence of foot shock, the initial association appears to occur within the lateral amygdala nucleus involving long-term potentiation of glutamatergic neurons in that structure. And that information is somehow relayed to a structure called the central nucleus of the amygdala that coordinates these behavioral autonomic and endocrine outputs that are associated with the fear state. Now, this model of amygdala function is largely based on uh, traditional neuroanatomical analysis, including stimulation and lesion experiments. And those lesions generally take out entire structures comprised of multiple cell types. And this is really the level of functional neuroanatomy 
uh, at the time that the Allen Brain Atlas came uh, into the picture. That is, it's an attempt to describe the brain and its function at the level of these nuclei and the interconnections between the nuclei, as well as the longer range connections between aggregates of nuclei like the amygdala and other structures. The problem is, as techniques have become more refined and people have begun to do more precise injections of drugs to target these structures rather than just burning a hole in the brain, the results have become fuzzier rather than clearer, with some studies reporting that the central amygdala is actually not required at all for certain types of learned fear, and other studies reporting that the central amygdala is actually required in the learning of conditioned fear, not in its experience expression. And I think the reason for a lot of these discrepancies and inconsistencies is because of the heterogeneity and complexity of these structures. So just the central nucleus of the amygdala is not a uniform structure. It's comprised of at least three distinct subdivisions. And within each of these subdivisions, there are multiple distinct cell types that can be discriminated, for example, by the expression of different neuropeptides. And you'll appreciate that when you inject a diffusible substance like a drug, into that structure, you have no idea which of those different types of neurons are acted on by the drug and whether different drugs act on the same types of neurons. And so our approach has been to try to take this, begin to take this structure apart at the level of specific genetically accessible cell types. And to do that, it's been essential to have molecular markers for the central amygdala, such as those provided by the Allen Brain Atlas. Now, if you look at a nissel-stained coronal section of the brain with an untrained eye, it's essentially impossible to recognize the central nucleus of the amygdala. There it is. But with the aid of a molecular marker for the amygdala, you can see that the central nucleus stands out very, very, very clearly, making it, first of all, much more easy to recognize. And here is a panel of different genes that express in this structure. Now, this doesn't mean that they're all in the same cells, but they can be used uh, as a point of entry to tackle the function of particular types of neurons. And that's what we've done for one particular marker, uh, which is protein kinase C delta, a marker that we chose because it's expressed at a high level, very crisply, in an all or none manner, in a restricted subpopulation of inhibitory neurons, GABAergic neurons, within the central nucleus of the amygdala. In particular, it's within, it's restricted to the lateral subdivision of the central nucleus, and within that subdivision, it's distinct from other populations of neurons that can be recognized recognized, for example, by staining with antibodies for corticotropin-releasing hormone, and overlaps partially with subpopulations defined by the expression of other neuropeptides. So before we put a lot of effort into mapping the uh, functional anatomy and connectivity of these neurons, we wanted to make sure that they were actually relevant to emotional behavior, and so we sought to undertake an approach that would allow us to manipulate their activity in freely behaving animals and ask what are the behavioral consequences of inactivating those neurons. And to do this, we took advantage of a method for genetically controlled electrical silencing, suppression of excitability of these neurons within the amygdala, developed by my colleague Henry Lester at Caltech. And this is based on the expression of a C. elegans-derived glutamate-activated ivermectin-sensitive chloride channel. Chloride, when it comes into the cell through this channel, hyperpolarizes the membrane and pre prevents action potential firing. Now, <clears throat> this uh, channel requires two subunits to function, an alpha and a beta subunit. And while that, at one level, is more cumbersome than other techniques that involve a single subunit, it lends itself nicely to intersectional strategies, which are important for increasing the specificity of manipulation of specific cell types in the amygdala. So, what we did is we generated transgenic mice that expressed the alpha subunit under the control of protein kinase C delta regulatory elements. And so this gave us a mouse that expresses the alpha subunit in the central amygdala and all the other places where protein kinase C delta is usually expressed. And so now we have to figure out a way to res restrict the silencing only to those protein kinase C delta neurons that are within the amygdala and not in these other structures. And this is a general problem for virtually all of the markers that are revealed by the Allen Brain Atlas. That is, 
they are highly specific for neurons within a number of different substructures within the brain. So it's necessary to further refine specificity in order to have targeted manipulation. So what we did in this case was to deliver the beta subunit by stereotaxic injection into the amygdala of an adeno-associated virus that constitutively expresses that beta subunit, which is tagged with YFP. The alpha is tagged with CFP. So then within the amygdala, we'll get three different types of cells. We'll get cells that are infected by the virus and express the beta subunit, but don't express protein kinase C delta, and therefore don't express the alpha subunit. They should not be sensitive to ivermectin silencing. We'll get cells that express the PKC delta driven glucl alpha transgene, but were not infected by the virus. They should also be insensitive to ivermectin. And then we'll get cells that express the transgene in blue and are also infected by the AAV glucl beta virus, and those should be sensitive to ivermectin. And we can show this directly by cutting slices from such injected animals and prospectively identifying cells that express both the alpha and the beta subunit, the beta subunit alone, or just the alpha subunit alone. And what we do is we patch onto these cells and inject current to make them spike. You see that these cells are all of the late bursting subclass of neurons. And when we infuse ivermectin into the bath, we get a suppression in spiking only in those cells that express both the alpha and the beta subunits and not in those cells that express beta alone or in those cells that express alpha alone. So this now gives us the ability to manipulate these cells in this way in vivo and ask what is the consequence for emotional behavior of silencing this specific population of neurons in the central amygdala. You'll recall that in classical experiments, when you lesion the central amygdala as a whole structure, you lose conditioned freezing. By contrast, what we find is that when we suppress the activity of the specific population of PKC delta neurons in vivo, we get an increase in freezing in comparison to control. So it's the opposite result that you get than when you take out the entire structure, indicating the importance of targeting genetically distinct subpopulations of neurons. So now, if ivermectin indeed suppresses the excitability of these neurons, as our in vitro study suggests, and if this leads to an increase in the expression of conditioned fear, that suggests that these neurons normally function to suppress the expression of conditioned fear. So now the question becomes, by what circuitry and connectivity do these neurons exert this suppressive effect on conditioned fear? And to do that, we then use molecular tools to map the anatomy and connectivity and synaptic connections of these neurons. The first thing that we know is that, as I said, these neurons are GABAergic. They express the GABA synthesizing enzyme GAD65. They also reside in a structure which, as far as we know, does not itself contain outputs from the amygdala, but is adjacent to the subnucleus of the central amygdala, the medial subnucleus, which contains the output neurons. So we hypothesize that perhaps these PKC delta neurons send short-range inhibitory projections to output neurons in the medial subdivision that project to centers in the brainstem that control freezing. So we wanted to test this hypothesis hypothesis as directly as possible. Do PKC delta neurons in CEL functionally inhibit output neurons that project to the brainstem? And to do that, we did the following experiment. We took advantage of the fact that our transgenic mice express, in addition to the alpha summit of GluCL, Cre recombinase, uh, which you heard Alan mention before, an enzyme that can be used to restrict expression of viral vectors and reporters to particular cell types. And into those mice, we first injected an adeno-associated virus that expresses a Cre-dependent form of the light-activated channel, channel rhodopsin, which you'll hear about from Ed Boyden. What this does is make it possible to activate PKC delta neurons by blue light. Now, in the same mice, we tagged the neurons that project from the amygdala to the brainstem by injecting a retrograde tracer that's fluorescently labeled with a red dye into those brainstem targets and letting it get transported back to the cell bodies in the amygdala. After waiting enough time for this transport and expression to occur, we cut slices 
from these mice, we can identify the output neurons in the amygdala by their red fluorescence and then patch onto them with a patch clamp electrode. And then we can ask, if we inject current into these neurons to make them spike, what is the effect of simultaneously then activating the PKC delta neurons, which express channel rhodopsin with a blue light source. And so when we do this experiment, it's very clear. Without any light, injecting current into those output neurons makes them spike. And as soon as you start flashing the light pulse, you get a strong suppression of spiking activity. And that suppression is blocked by picrotoxin, which is a drug that blocks GABAergic transmission. And the time course of the iPSCs that we see in association with this light stimulation is indicative of monosomal synaptic connections. So these data demonstrate as directly as we can uh, uh, conceive that these PKC delta neurons may, do indeed make inhibitory connections onto output neurons uh, that go to the brain stem, as shown in this diagram. But <clears throat> things are more complicated, as they always are in the brain, and what we discovered is that in addition to these feed-forward inhibitory connections onto the output structure, CEM, the PKC delta neurons also make lateral inhibitory connections onto a second population of amygdala neurons within the same subnucleus, the lateral subdivision of CE, that don't express PKC delta. And again, we use the same channel rhodopsin stimulation with simultaneous patch clamp recording to show show that inhibition. Now, we wanted to know whether that inhibition was bidirectional, whether there was mutual inhibition between these two cell types, and we didn't have a gene marker for these PKC delta negative neurons in the way that we did for the PKC delta positive neurons, so we used a virally based retrograde labeling technique. Again, this is one of the tools that Alan referred to in his talk, and so I'll show it to you in action. So this is a technique developed by Ed Calloway, and that allows for tracing the input to a neuron that is just one synapse away. And basically, it involves successively infecting the animals with two viruses. One virus, which is the one that's shown in blue here, specifically uh, infects the protein kinase C delta positive cells, and it allows those cells and only those cells to become infected by a second virus, which is a disabled rabies virus that expresses a red fluorescent protein, cherry. And in those cells, that virus can go through one cycle of replication and be picked up by neurons that input to those cells and label the monosynaptically the inputs but stops movement at that particular point. And what we see indeed is that within the central amygdala, there's a subpopulation of red red cells that are not green, that is their PKC delta negative cells that are located intermingled in many cases with the PKC delta positive cells, and those cells express GABA, indicating that they're inhibitory neurons. And so by those neuroanatomical criteria, that suggests that there is indeed a reciprocal feedback inhibition from the PKC delta negative cells onto the PKC delta positive cells. So what these data indicate is that PKC delta neurons participate in a recurrent inhibitory network within CEL that also exerts feed-forward inhibition onto output neurons in the brainstem. Now, what might the physiological significance of those neurons be? We know that suppressing these neurons increases fear, but we can't really say anything from these data about the relationship of the circuit and how it operates when the animal is exposed to the conditioned stimulus, the tone. And in this case, we're, we're extremely fortunate that at the same time, in parallel independent work, Andreas Luthi, an electrophysiologist at the Friedrich Miescher Institute in Basel, and his student Stefan Schaki had been performing recordings in vivo from precisely the same region of the amygdala where our PKC delta neurons lived. And they've been doing this in awake, freely behaving animals during fear conditioning experiments. And interestingly, after fear conditioning, they observed two types of neurons within this structure. One type of neuron showed an increase in activity upon presentation of the conditioned stimulus, and these they called CEL on units and another type of neuron showed the opposite response to the conditioned stimulus, that is, it suppressed its activity, and those were called CEL off units. And so we wondered whether there might be a correspondence between these two types of electrophysiologically defined units and the molecularly defined PKC delta positive and PKC delta negative neurons. Now, for those of you who are not experts in electrophysiology, 
This is a non-trivial question because these in vivo recordings are made with extracellular electrodes. So it's not possible to inject the recorded cells with a dye and then simply section the brain and stain them afterwards to see if they express protein kinase C delta. So we need an indirect approach to link, see if we can link molecular and physiological identity in this system. And so what we did was we sent our transgenic mice uh, to Luthi and his student Stefan. They then, now going back to the ivermectin system, they injected the beta subunit into the amygdala of these mice, waited four weeks for expression, and then inserted their extracellular multi-unit recording bundle directly into the site where those neurons are located. So now what they're going to do is condition the animal identify tone on and tone off cells in the absence of any ivermectin and then once those units are identified they'll put ivermectin into the animals it crosses the blood-brain barrier so it can be injected intraperitoneally and see which of those units if any is affected by the ivermectin and indeed the results were very striking if you focus on the blue dots you'll see that uh, at uh, shortly after ivermectin injection, the tonic activity of the off units was strongly suppressed by silencing protein kinase C delta neurons, while the on units were unaffected or, if anything, slightly increased. Interestingly, at the same time, there was a strong significant increase in the activity of the CEM neurons, which is exactly what you would predict from our finding that these CE, uh, PKC delta neurons inhibit output neurons in CEM. If you inhibit the inhibitory neurons, then you expect more activity in their targets. So what these data suggest is that there is a correspondence between molecular identity defined by PKC delta and electrophysiological identity defined by these in vivo recordings in awake behaving animals. And because the ability to silence these neurons gives us behavioral relevance uh, of the cells, we can use that equation to infer the behavioral relevance of the CEL off units. And similarly, because the CEL off units show us how these cells respond to the presentation of a conditioned stimulus, we can use that to infer something about the in vivo properties of the PKC delta neurons. And so I think the ability to achieve this kind of linkage between molecular identity and physiological identity will be extremely important going forward. It won't always be true. It need not be the case that every molecular marker necessarily maps onto an electrophysiologically distinct cell type, uh, but in this case it appears to at least in part. So what we've uncovered here is a recurrent inhibitory microcircuit that appears to control freezing via disinhibition of output neurons in CEM. So the idea is that the conditioned stimulus comes in, it, it, it activates these CEL on neurons, which in turn inhibit the PKC delta CEL off neurons. And since those neurons normally inhibit the output neurons, this inhibition causes a disinhibition of the output neurons, leading to increased activity and increased freezing. How information is relayed from the, the brain areas that detect the CS into the substructure uh, is not at all clear and is an important topic for the future. But I think this type of reciprocally interconnected inhibitory circuit has some potentially interesting properties that are worthy of further exploration, both by experimentalists like ourselves and by comp uh, computational neuroscientists. For one thing, for example, it can provide positive feedback amplification of phasic responses to the tone. So this becomes a sort of winner-take-all circuit that amplifies the response of the on units to the tone. In addition, the fact that these units show changes in their tonic activity suggests that differences in the balance of stable tonic activity between the off and the on units or oscillations between the activity of those units might be useful in encoding certain states, for example, states of anxiety uh, that uh, influence the way the animal behaves in a setting of conditioned fear. And those will be important properties to explore in the future. Most of all, what this gives us is a point of entry into the microcircuitry of the amygdala and will allow us both to trace the feed forward connections of these cells and also their inputs from centers in the cortex as well as other amygdala centers. And in the long range, I think this type of information is extremely important for understanding how and where in the brain repetitive stress, environmental influences that cause disorders such as PTSD, genetic predispositions to anxiety,
underscore drugs that we take to alleviate anxiety, where and how they exert their effects on the brain to produce these uh, effects on emotional behavior. And as uh, one preliminary experiment in the case of anxiolytic drugs, we've actually found that these PKC delta neurons are specifically activated by benzodiazepines, which are an important class of commonly prescribed anxiolytic drugs. Many of you may know these as Xanax or under other terms. And importantly, our preliminary data suggest that when we block the activity of these PKC delta neurons using ivermectin, we actually inhibit the anti-anxiety effect of benzodiazepine. So if this were true, it might suggest that these cells are part of an important node that is targeted by this class of anxiolytic drugs. Now, Alan asked uh, that uh, uh, we uh, emphasize the unknowns and the open questions. Here are some of the things that we need to know, which are, of course, much more than what we do know. We need to know what are the targets in the medial part of the central amygdala of the on cells. Are they the same as the off cells? Is this a symmetrical system, or are they different? Is it an asymmetric system? What is the relative strength of those connections? We need to know the inputs to the off and the on units. Both of these neurons have neuropeptides, different neuro peptides. There's important knowledge to be learned in understanding the respective role of peptidergic versus fast GABAergic transmission in the system, the roles, as I mentioned briefly, of phasic versus tonic activity. And Luthi and his colleagues have shown that plastic changes in the tonic activity and the phasic activity of these neurons occur during fear conditioning. So this GABAergic microcircuit also shows learning-dependent plasticity. What are the dynamics of this type of recurrently interconnected inhibitory circuit under different conditions? It would be useful to collaborate with computational neuroscientists to develop quantitative models that make testable predictions that we can then uh, investigate using the molecular tools that are available. And does this circuit, is this circuit specific to condition fear? Does it play a role in other emotional states such as anxiety uh, or other types of conditioning? Now, the technology that we're going to need to really understand a system like this, uh, you may hear about from Ed Boyden. One of the most important needs is the ability to carry out simultaneously multi-unit recordings and functional perturbations in deep brain structures of freely behaving animals so that we can watch the cells as they're firing, know what populations are giving rise to which spikes, and look at the behavioral consequences and the electrophysiological consequences of a functional perturbation like silencing or activation. And that will help us uh, further link physiological and molecular identity of neurons in these circuits. We need to be able to carry out functional perturbations on different time scales. Ivermectin acts on a time scale of hours. It's important to see what happens when we perturb activity in a time scale of milliseconds or minutes. We need more facile intersectional strategies and more specific promoters for neuronal subtypes. These viral injection strategies are brutal and inefficient and take too long, and so it's an extremely important contribution from the Allen Institute to try to develop better promoters, more specific promoters, and intersectional strategies so that these types of viral approaches aren't always necessary. And then importantly, it's we need to develop, we as a community, more sophisticated, quantitative, and automated measures of behavior. Mice and fear conditioning paradigms do more than just freeze. You can see that if you look at it with the unaided eye. We need ways of quantifying and measuring that so that we can begin to analyze in a more subtle way the consequences of different types of specific experimental perturbations. Now, all of this may seem like we're sort of digging around in the weeds and looking at very, very specific uh, properties of a tiny little microcircuit in a subdivision of the amygdala. But the fact is that this is what you have to solve if you're going to begin to take apart the brain at the level, level of specific cell types. You are of necessity forced to study microcircuitry. And the hope is that one can begin to learn something about the functional properties of these microcircuits and relate that back to the electrophysiological properties of the different types of neurons that comprise those microcircuits. As I mentioned, the PKC delta neurons are late onset bursting. There are rapid onset bursting neurons within that microcircuit as well. And these are the properties, of course, that are determined by genes as well as connectivity. And then to build outwards from understanding the properties of microcircuits to the interactions between different microcircuits across a larger scale in different regions of the brain. And that's one of the long-range objectives of the connectional 
uh, atlas and the mouse brain that the Allen in, uh, Institute is undertaking. And the hope is that by combining this type of bottom-up approach with top-down systems-level analysis of the behavior on, of ensembles of neurons and the emergent properties that can arise from such ensembles under various conditions, that we'll begin to get an inkling of the mechanisms that underlie some of the properties that I raised at the beginning, such as perception, emotion, and cognition. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll just acknowledge my coworkers, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank <laughs> you.